Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us this morning for this program, The Winning Way with BTK Inhibitors and CLL. You know, we're excited to be here today and to, uh, share some inf new information with you over the next um, hour and a half or so about BTK's uh, inhibitors in CLL using evidence-based informed choices, treatment selection safety, and sequencing. Uh, the uh, my two uh, panelists, uh, co-panelists, Dr. Brenthus and Dr. Lamana, you know, are you know, will be um, discussing and making this relevant to cases that we are are real patients and you know, probably very similar to what you'd see in your practice. A big question for all of us is where targeted you know, BCR signaling you know, sits and uh, how. You know, can BTK best afford it? And you know, there are a number of small molecules that target this pathway. And this is a, you know, a figure that I love to show when I introduce this topic, because as oncologists, we're taught one drug and cancer is generally not going to work. And I think how we have to think about BTK inhibitors is it's not one drug, or it's not one target. It's really going after three different targets. It's going after BCR signaling, is say integrin signaling and toll receptor signaling, all which are important to CLL. And when we look at you know, the diseases where we see durable, durable, durable remissions with this class of drugs, you know, particularly Waldenstrom's and CLL and SLL, all three of these mechanisms of action are important. As you drop down to the other diseases where it's perhaps less, uh, you know, one, one or two is less important, the drug is not a game changer, but, or the target's not a game changer, but it's active. So we have a number of, B, of BTK inhibitors that are in the, that are in the clinic, um, and either in clinical trials early on, that we're not going to talk about today, and then we have three that are approved, abrutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib, and then two non-covalent inhibitors, pertabrutinib and nem nematabrutinib, um, it's, it's a tongue twister, that are in later uh, phase two, phase three uh, testing. I think all of them are in phase three testing as of um, yesterday. We, you know, say right now, we have the uh, guidelines, you know, that the NCCN puts out for patients um, without deletion 17P uh, and P and or P53 mutations. That include our second generation BTK inhibitors, either xanabrutinib or acalabrutinib plus or minus abinutuzumab being preferred. And still, abrutinib is a category one, but Dr. Lamana will talk to us about why there's been some slippage in using ibrutinib as initial as a startup therapy, um, and then we have venetoclax and venetuzumab that's also a, a category one agent that is time limited. We see similar we see similar uh, fi guidelines for patients with deletion 17P and P53. Although you know, say Dr. Brentos will sort of I think make a case that for this group venetoclax and abinutuzumab might not be as good a therapy, at least in a time-limited manner. And then lastly, you know, at the bottom, we have the category 2B of combining ibrutinib with venetoclax, which you know, is being addressed in clinical trials. There'll be some data presented by you know, several of us, but this is, I think this still has to be viewed as a research uh, question. Well, for sure, this class of drugs has changed the natural history of CLL, but uh, you know a group where we've seen the biggest uh, you know the biggest change. And Deborah Stevens um, at Ohio State published a paper soon after ibrutinib was approved, showing a dramatic difference in 17P patients, where you know really once they got to the point of needing treatment, they had a year survival, uh, say with whatever you did. Um, you know, and the donor paper looks from time, uh, you know, the, the you know, curve in orange, 
it looks at from time to diagnosis, and again, you know, the median is still pretty short. And uh, you know, Dr. Ahn, from pr perspective data, looking at their series at the, at the NHLBI, uh, you know, showed similar findings where you, we're seeing really, really improved overall survival and progression-free survival when this class of drugs is used for initial therapy. So despite this, we have it's, it's a real-world data that suggests we need to do more, and we need to really look at what we're doing. Because, you know, if we look at Europe and the ERIC, the, you know, the ERIC data, we're still, despite multiple studies showing chemoimmunotherapy is inferior to BTK inhibitors, it's still being used frontline in, in Europe in 60% of patients. And similarly, uh, the Flatiron database from you know, cancer clinics, again, looking at real world between 2015 and 2020, showed, you know, that 46% of patients do receive targeted therapy with BTK inhibitors as initial therapy, but still 33% received, you know, chemoimmunotherapy, and 20% received rituximab, or you know, CD20 antibody, which really, if you're using it for autoimmune complications, that's fine, but not really a, a good first-line therapy for patients. So why, so, you know, say, why might people shy away from this? And, you know, clearly uh, adverse events, particularly with the first generation, you know, with ibrutinib, is is more common, but we also see this with the second, you know, the second generation molecules, and perhaps this happens earlier on in therapy a bit more, where patients, uh, you know, where patients have other options. Whereas in the earlier studies, you know, it was dealing with these complications of arthralgias, diarrhea, as say bruising and atrial fibrillation, or dying of your disease. And so most patients chose to stay on the drug. Whereas when it's somebody new that's starting, there are other choices, and you know, they may not. Uh, stick with it. We have resistance that, that's coming up, and we'll talk about this, um, is, say, it, toward the end of the session today. So, it, with that in mind, we've you know, worked with it, you know, say, with the team, um, organized with Peerview, and it, tried to build case-based clinical consult discussions in how we might choose the BTK inhibitor or other targeted therapies in CLL. Is for most patients, we believe this is the best approach to take initially for patients with CLL in virtually all, um, all settings. Now, uh, using the safety profiles of the different drugs, whether it be BTK inhibitors, venetoclax, to pick the best th therapy for our patients. And then nuances of what to do when that first choice with a BTK inhibitor either doesn't work or the uh, you know the patient uh, you, know, you know the patient runs into issues even in the setting of double refractory disease. So, with that, I'd like to uh, turn the calm over to Dr. Brentis, um, who's the chief of hematologic malignancies and the director of oncologic research, um, and say at the Mount Sinai Medical Se Medical Center in Miami, Florida who's going to talk with us about, um, his, his, her title of her talk is The Way to Better Outcomes and Treatment Naive CLL, Customized Choice for High-Risk um, CLL. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here with my co-panelists. And so we'll start off our talk with a clinical consult question. This is a patient named Margaret. She has high-risk disease. She has symptomatic treatment naive disease, anemia, thrombocytopenia, with a good performance status. She's 56 and has diabetes. Her testing shows FISH4 um, deletion 17P and 13Q. NGS shows TPVC3 mutated, and she has unmutated IGHB. So the talk today will talk about what are the treatment options. Continuous BTKI therapy, BTKI plus CD20 antibody, fixed duration treatment strategy with BEN-G or venetoclax and aminutuzumab, a novel uh, fixed duration combination or chemoimmunotherapy. So let's talk about the longer follow-up from major trials and the evidence with BTK inhibitors in high-risk CLL. On your left side, you have the uh, drugs called ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and sanabrutinib. As you all know, ibrutinib was the first class um, oral agent targeting BTK. And because of that, it has more longer follow-up um, as evidenced by the landmark trials of Resonate 2, Illuminate, 
ECOC 1912 in younger patients and Alliance in older patients. Acalabrutinib um, was approved for frontline with the trial of Elevate TN and in relapse refractory disease for ASCEND trial. And Elevate RR was a trial that compared acalabrutinib against ibrutinib, and it showed that the drug was non-inferior with a better safety profile. Sanobrutinib is the latest second generation BTK inhibitor that is covalently bound to BTK that is about to uh, be considered by the FDA for approval in CLL based on the uh, Sequoia trial, which showed superior PFS against BR in treatment naive disease, and the Alpine trial will be presented, which shows an improved safety profile versus Ibrutinib. This trial will be uh, presented as a late breaking abstract at, uh, at this year's ASH. And on the right side, we have the only BCL2 inhibitor approved by the FDA, the Netoclax. This drug was approved based on two trials, the CLL14 for a treatment naive that showed superiority of VNG combination against ovinutuzumab with chlorambucil, and the Murano trial, which uses the combination of venetoclax with rituximab for two years. So with longer follow-up, we have known that the BTK inhibitors have continuous efficacy. As you can see here, ibrutinib has a length of follow-up of eight years versus acalabrutinib of five years, and the median PFS has not been reached with either drug uh, when compared to the standard of care. There's shorter follow-up for Sequoia, which is the drug for sanabrutinib, but there's substantially improved PFS against BR. So we know that these drugs are very efficient and very efficacious and respond. So how do they do and work in patients with 17P deletion or TP53? As you can see here, this is the pooled analysis of 89 patients that had either a 17P deletion by FISH or TP53 mutation by next-generation sequencing. Um, the ibrutinib was given a single agent on PCYC 1122 or Resonate 2, or in combination with a monoclonal antibody in Illuminate or E1912. Both um, used a monoclonal antibody. At a median follow-up of almost 50 months, the PFS and OS estimates at four years were 79 and 88% respectively. So excellent compared to the um, graph that Dr. Bird just showed you before, where the overall survival was expected to be about two to three years for these patients with this condition. Not only this, when you do other uh, trials where you do ibrutinib in combination with a monoclonal antibody, you see that there's no difference whether or not you have the mutation in patients treated with ibrutinib plus G or ibrutinib plus or minus rituximab. If you see the line, of patients treated with here with BR, as you can see, these patients have a TP53 mutation and as such do not respond well to chemoimmunotherapy. This is the reason why we recommend not treating these patients with chemoimmunotherapy and we advise and recommend for every single patient to be tested for this mutation either by FISH and, or, and also by next generation sequencing to make sure that we don't expose them to drugs that may not have an efficacy. Now let's talk about acalabrutinib. The ACL001 was the study, the phase one study, and these final results will have an updated poster presentation on Monday. After six years of follow-up, the results confirmed that acalabrutinib monotherapy has excellent response rates, rapid, durable responses, including patients with high-risk disease. As you can see here, even patients with 17P deletion had a very long remission duration and the media of PFS was not reached even at this long-term follow-up. In terms of the LFATN, which is the landmark trial that led to the approval of acalabrutinib back in 2019, um, this drug was uh, given as monotherapy or in combination with ovinutuzumab, and with a longer follow-up in patients treated that had the mutation TP53, the PFS was 71% at 16 months. So identical in either arm, meaning these patients do respond regardless of whether or not they have the presence of this high-risk marker. And let's talk about sanabrutinib. This is cohort two on the Sequoia trial. These patients had a deletion 17P at a median observation time of 30.5 months. The median PFS has not yet been reached, and the 24-month PFS is 89%. So now let's talk about fixed duration treatment strategy. How do these patients do? 
Um, remember, uh, this is the CLL14 trial where patients were treated with venetoclax and tovinutuzumab, and the drug regimen was given for a year. At the five-year PFS update last presented at EHA 2022, on your right-hand side, you will see that patients that have a 17P deletion do not do as well as patients that do not have this. The median PFS is uh, reached, whereas if you don't have a 17P deletion, you're still um, in remission for the most part. Now, in terms of IGHG influence, this study was also um, presented with a longer follow-up. And with a longer follow-up, we also see a difference that patients that have unmutated IGHB will relapse sooner with a median PFS of unmutated IGHB patients of around 60 months, whereas patients that have mutated disease are still in remission. So are there any benefits to continuous versus time-limited treatment strategies against um, higher-risk CLL? So, Dr. Rocker will present at this year's ASH a real-world study using the Flat Iron Health and Health database, where they followed patients in first-line and in second-line settings. And BTK in inhibitor monotherapy delayed the time to next-line therapy compared to uh, venetoclax and aminutuzumab in the second-line setting. So there is a trend toward longer treatment uh, time to next line setup in the first line setting that did not reach statistical significance. I think this study is a little bit um, thought provoking um, that maybe for patients with high risk disease, it might be better to do uh, continuous daily dosing. And also it could be possible that the fixed duration treatment strategy doesn't work very well, not because it's not uh, work you know, working, but it's because maybe because we didn't do the right combination treatment strategy. So can BTK inhibitor and the netoclax combinations improve the outcomes of what we have seen on the CLL14 trial in patients with high-risk CLL? We'll discuss that now. So we have the Captivate trial, which is the phase two trial with fixed duration ibrutinib plus venetoclax. If you remember, it's three months of ibrutinib as a single agent to debulk the patients and minimize the risk for tumor lysis syndrome, and then you do 12 months of combined therapy. As you can see here, the response rate were very impressive, 96% for all patients treated, with patients achieving a complete remission in the majority of cases, which if you remember for patients treated with single agent uh, ibrutinib, it's very hard to get, especially after only one year when the minor majority are only in partial remission. So as you can see here, these are the treatment period of a total of um, 15, you know, 15 months, then you stop the therapy of combined therapy. And when you do the longer follow-up, it really doesn't matter whether you have or carry the high-risk mutation of TP53, you're still in remission for the most part. So the combination achieves very good responses that are sustained, even though these patients are not getting uh, long-term continuous daily dosing with ibrutinib. Now let's talk about the Captivate updated uh, evidence from MRD cohorts. Um, if you see here at this year's ASH, there's an oral abstract that will be updated with an additional year of follow-up in patients with confirmed undetectable MRD. The four-year overall survival rates were over 98%. The durability of uh, the undetectable MRD and the three-year uh, duration-free survival rate of 85 without ongoing treatment are encouraging here. If you see the patients are still in remission 85% of the time at three years, even though they did not receive a longer continuous daily dosing of ibrutinib. So this might be a safe and effective treatment strategy for a patient that is young. Remember the Captivate trial was for patients that were younger. You had to be 65 or, or younger. In terms of sanabrutinib venetoclax combination, this is a, a cohort three from the Sequoia trial. This is ARMD that tested the combination of sanabrutinib and venetoclax in high-risk CLL. Now, of the 36 available patients, 14 were treated with the combination strategy for at least 12 months. And as you can see here, the overall response rate was very similar to what was previously presented on Captivate trial, 97%. At least at this time of the evaluation, the uh, majority are still in partial remission. It's possible that these um, responses may depend, but we won't know until more mature data comes up. 
So let's talk about ongoing accrual trials. MAGIC phase three study will test acalabrutinib and venetoclax in combination in patients with CLL and SLL. About 750 patients will be recruited from 40 sites worldwide, and the patients will be randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either receive acalabrutinib with venetoclax with a two-month cycle of acalabrutinib leading against venetoclax and tovinutuzumab, which is the current standard of care for a fixed duration treatment strategy. These patients will be followed, and then an MRD will be found after you know, 14 months or 12 months, depending on the arm that you're randomized. If you have undetectable MRD, you will stop any more therapy. And if you have positive MRD by testing, you do 12 more months for a total of 24 months total of either regimen. And then you follow up with a primary endpoint of pro uh, progression-free survival. It's an event-driven analysis. Now let's talk about CLL2-GIF. This is a study where you do induction and maintenance for patients with high-risk treatment of CLL. It's a time-limited therapy with ibrutinib, venetoclax, and amiltuzumab, and it's followed by maintenance ibrutinib. So the total number was 41 patients, all had either 17P deletion or TP53 mutated disease, and the primary endpoint was complete remission at cycle 15. The efficacy outcome showed that uh, it was 58.5% where the primary endpoint was met, and the rates of undetectable MRD at the final restaging was 78% in the peripheral blood and 65% in the bone marrow. So very similar correlation between what you see in the blood and the bone marrow. The PFS at 24 months was 95%, and the overall survival at 24 months is also 95%. So very good and excellent outcomes with this type of combination. So what happens if we do three drug regimen? So this study was from um, the Boston group where they did acalabrutinib, venetoclax, and dovinutuzumab, or AVO. Um, the study will be up presenting an updated, uh, more mature data at an oral abstract on Saturday in the afternoon. So 68 patients were enrolled in this phase two study. Majority had high-risk disease, namely 60% had either 17P or tp 53 mutated disease. 24% of the patients had a complex karyotype, so three or more chromosomal abnormalities, and 74% of them had a mutated IGHV. So the take-home message is that this is a safe, well-tolerated triplet, highly active, where you see here the majority of patients achieved undetectable MRD with durable responses at three years median follow-up, 93% of the patients are still in remission with very low rates of cardiac and infectious toxicities. If you can see here on the, this is the rate for um, undetectable MRD disease by peripheral blood and in the bone marrow. So very similar at 16, cycle 16 day one. So let's go back to the initial concept. She has symptomatic disease, 56-year-old female with diabetes, um, good performance status, anemia, thrombocytopenia, with 17P deletion, TP53 mutation, unmutated IGHV. These are your options. Based on what we just discussed, our recommendations are, at this moment, we feel that continuous VTK inhibitor therapy is a very potent and preferred treatment option strategy for patients with a deletion 17P or TP53. Fixed duration uh, venetoclax with ovinotuzumab uh, regimen is effective, but the degree of benefit in high risk remains uncertain. As you remember from the uh, kaplan meier curve that I presented you, these patients do tend to relapse sooner. So to date, the novel venetoclax with BTK inhibitor combinations show impressive activity in high-risk settings. As of right now, it's, the combination is approved in uh, the European markets, but it's still um, not yet approved in the United States. It's still part of the NCCN guidelines. And you have to remember that you have to balance the risk, increased toxicity risk, and the long-term benefit is still uncertain because their follow-ups still short compared to what we have from the longer follow-up from the other drugs as a single agent. And there's no role for patients to be treated with chemoimmunotherapy. So please always make sure that 
anytime before you start therapy, regardless of it treatment naive or relapsed refractory disease, you test for that dreaded 17P deletion or TPC mutation. And the last take home message on choosing BTK inhibitor options in treatment naive CLL. When you select the upfront BTK inhibitor therapy, be aware of the prognostic features. High risk patients with CLL, namely 17P deletion, TP53 mutated disease, and mutated IGHV, should be prioritized for evaluation at centers with access to clinical trials, either at treatment naive state or also relapsed refractory disease. First and second generation BTK inhibitors have shown to be active drugs for patients with TP53 mutated disease. The current data suggests that the highest benefit is con continuous daily dosing for these agents, and time-limited treatment strategies are still being evaluated in ongoing clinical trials for combinations with doublets and triplets. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. You, you've got, you say, you've got a question that, that from four or five members in the four or five members in the audience. Um, when do you when do you use a CD20 antibody in high-risk patients? Is there a benefit to that? So, personally, I've only used them when patients have other issues ongoing. For example, autoimmune hemolytic anemia or autoimmune thrombocytopenia that is very, very difficult to be controlled with a BTK inhibitor. Uh, the original trials from the Alliance and E9 uh, Alliance, for example, showed no benefit of adding uh, rituximab as a monoclonal antibody to ibrutinib. Now, the ELEVATE-TN trial is showing that there might be a difference, but remember, this study was not powered to detect a statistically a significant difference between the two arms. So as of right now, we continue to recommend single-agent acalabrutinib and only add on the obinutuzumab for certain patients that may benefit from the addition of a monoclonal antibody for unrelated reasons. I've had other patients that the disease, the CD, um, the tp 3 mutation was moving too fast for the drug to catch up by its own, and so I added the obinutuzumab to help with expedite the response. Great. Thanks. So, Dr. Lamana, who's an associate professor of medicine and the director of the chronic lymphocytic leukemia program in the hematologic malignancy section at, say, at Presbyter uh, say New York Presbyterian Columbia, University Medical Center is going to talk next about better outcomes and treatment naive CLL patients based upon informed therapy selection. So, as Dr. Bird mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about the safety data with regards to BTK inhibitors and venetoclax. I'll touch upon a little bit as well. We'll start with the case, William. So, he's an older gentleman with symptomatic CLL with splenomegaly. He's 76 year old. He has mild renal insufficiency and a history of hypertension. He has no deletion 17P, and he has an unmutated IgHV. So what are the potential options for therapy for this older gentleman? Continuous BTK inhibitor-based therapy, and if so, which one? Fixed duration venetoclax obinutuzumab or chemoimmunotherapy. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, safety profiles of these targeted therapies that we've been discussing that really have transformed how we treat our patients to date. And as many of you are aware, obviously, why we're having this discussion is there are known toxicities with the BTK inhibitors as a class that we're all very familiar with. Um, and so the common toxicities that we traditionally see and we speak about the most happen to be the cardiovascular toxicities, particularly atrial fibrillation, although Ventricular arrhythmias are obviously, uh, uh, can happen and occur as well and noted for, for fatalities on some of the studies. Um, we also talk about the increased risk of bruising and bleeding in our patients and hence the counseling that need to occur with surgical procedures uh, when our patients are on a BTK inhibitor. Increased risk of hypertension and remember, CLL is a, is a disease typically of older individuals and many of our, our folks have other comorbidities including baseline hypertension. Uh, and so this needs to be managed accordingly and paid attention to while on a BTK inhibitor. And then there are, of course, these other side effects that could be um, uh, maybe less severe, but of course, day-to-day uh, -day can be annoying for our patient population. And so arthralgias uh, is a common toxicity that we see. Um, and in fact, sometimes that can actually be uh, a dose inhibiting uh, despite reduction, and some people really do come off due to that issue. Infections, of course, are, are part and parcel of what we do in our CLL patient population because they can happen 
uh, to our patients in general, but certainly on therapies, we do see increased incidence of infections as well. Uh, and then GI toxicity, such as diarrhea. As I said, there are additional toxicities to be aware about. Dermatologic changes, again, more nagging to patients. Uh, you know, we tend to, tend to be less focused on them, but pitting nail changes, hair thinning, things that obviously really do, you know, important for the patients who remain on this chronic continuous therapy. Fatigue can sometimes be an issue with the BTK inhibitors and cytopenia, sometimes requiring dose reduction or growth factor support. And then when we talk about venetoclax, of course, you know, I think obviously the cumbersome initiation sometimes of the therapy, uh, despite a time-limited and fixed duration of therapy with venetoclax and obinutuzumab, obviously the bigger issue has to be with tumor lysis monitoring and the ramp-up. So, you know, once you get beyond that ramp-up, the drug is actually pretty, uh, very easy to use, and the toxicity profile is pretty generally mild, and some of us feel that patients uh, really come off much less due to those therapies when they're beyond the ramp-up than to some of the BTK inhibitors. Uh, but tumor lysis monitoring is, is very important. I see that keeps doing that, yeah. despite you not touching either. I got you. Um, and then, uh, of course, there are GI side effects as well with venetoclax, uh, including diarrhea and sometimes constipation, believe it or not. Um, and infection issues are true with this drug as well. And then there tends to be a little bit more myelosuppression with this agent because of the enhancement of, obviously, what this drug does is it cleans out the bone marrow more efficiently than the BTK inhibitors. Uh, and so certainly there could be more myelosuppression, particularly neutropenia and thrombocytopenia that needs to be attended to, and sometimes dose reductions accordingly uh, for those issues as well. So with regards to, to the uh, safety issues, looking at these, the class effect, um, of these adverse events. This is obviously, as Dr. Berentos had already noted, most of the, we have the longest follow-up with the Brutna being the first to market. So from the Resonate, Resonate 2, Illuminate Alliance and the ECOG studies, you could see that the BTK adverse events um, vary in frequency. We focus a lot on the atrial fibrillation, somewhere being anywhere from five to 15%. Um, but you could see that the hematologic uh, toxicities and uh, hypertension and infection issues are common from the abrutinib studies that we see here. Fast forward to now the newer uh, second generation BTK inhibitors with a calabrutinib and xanabrutinib from the Ascend and the Elevate TN study. And then of course we have uh, studies now with xanabrutinib with more maturing data uh, coming along. And again, these are not direct comparisons, but you could see here that in the whole, some of these uh, adverse events of clinical interest seem to be less in frequency uh, compared to the studies that I just showed you with abrutinib. So what we discuss with our patients and when we counsel them and when we consider uh, when initiating a BTK inhibitor, you know, typically we talk about not using the BTK inhibitors with warfarin. And this really came from some of the initial data with abrutinib um, where warfarin, uh, there was noted to be some um, CNS hemorrhages with subdural hematomas and then warfarin was excluded from subsequent trials. Um, there are obviously, there are patients who are on other uh, anticoagulants and antiplatelet agents, and so you still have to consider that as increased risk of potential bleeding and counsel the, your patients accordingly. Uh, for the development of new onset atrial fibrillation, of course, the time of onset and repetitiveness of if this is a recurring event are important and for consideration. Um, and when that happens, to consider sort of non warfarin anticoagulation and monitor for bleeding. Uh, in young patients, consider electrophysiology evaluation for ablation procedures. And I think, you know, obviously there are some patients that we can continue, there's no doubt you can continue them on therapy uh, with a BTK inhibitor, but there's no doubt there are some patients who, if this is, they are not otherwise have never been on medications for managing atrial fibrillation or an anticoagulation and do not wish that they, you know, if it reverts and then they want to go back on therapy knowing that this potentially could occur again. There are some patients who really do choose to say, I do not want to be back on a BTK inhibitor because the potential of taking these other medications for management of this, I am not, I do not want to do. Uh, and then of other patients, of course, they're already on medications and have no problem with doing this. So that all, all, in and of itself is a discussion with your patients when this does happen. Hypertension is very important because, as we noted, um, and you'll see with some of the comparative data, this is um, uh, certainly something that um, needs to be managed for those who have never had hypertension or for those who have hypertension and are going on a BTK inhibitor. You want to make sure that, um, you, that, that certainly if they need dose management uh, adjustments in the medications that they're on for their blood pressure, that that's attended to as well. 
Uh, arthralgia, as I said, can be a little bit tricky and difficult to manage. Uh, most of that uh, can be dealt with with supportive care, and many of it does resolve. But there are some patients that, despite supportive care management, that it really does not improve. Um, and despite dose reduction um, or sensation, it can reoccur, and some patients really do come off therapy due to that. You can try some supplements. You can try some Tylenol. You can try some steroids. Um, but, of course, you have to have other considerations for doing so because of increased risk potentially for infection with steroids. Um, or if, you, if you're thinking about doing an NSAID, you know, whether or not, again, increased risk of bleeding or renal insufficiency. So supportive medicines for a short time are probably okay, uh, but certainly if, if this does not resolve, sometimes, again, dose reduction or holding back the dose altogether. Uh, but if it recurs, there are some patients who actually do come off therapy due to that. Now, what about the newer generation BTK inhibitors? We see that there are more headaches with the use of a calibrutinib. Typically, this is in the beginning of initiation of the therapy. Uh, it tends not to be a problem. Uh, I don't think I've ever had anybody who's come off of drug due to a calibrutinib. I'm not sure if, for that reason if either of you have had that, but typically not. Rare. Um, and mostly, this is a very, you know, something that you can get your patients through. You, you recommend taking Tylenol and caffeine. Uh, oftentimes, you could say if this occurs and it's unbearable, you know, let's start with just doing a drug at nighttime before bedtime uh, and getting them through that for a period of time and then dose escalating to twice a day. Uh, Xanabrutinib has more neutropenia associated with the drug, um, so certainly this needs to be watched for, and sometimes dose interruption or growth factor support may be necessary. Um, so you need to pay attention for some myelosuppression with these agents as well. Now, obviously, the hot topic has been the head-to-head -head comparisons of the BTK inhibitors, so we're going to focus a little bit on that. Obviously, we talked about the fact that the class effect of these drugs, there are certain, the, the adverse events that I just noted uh, are, are, are common, and obviously, um, with less selective BTK inhibitors, such as with abrutinib, um, there are more off-target effects that are obviously responsible for some of these adverse events. Uh, clearly, there are more selective uh, calibrutinib, zanabrutinib, and now, as Dr. Bird had mentioned, you have the non-covalent BTK inhibitors with pertabrutinib and nemtabrutinib, uh, and certainly uh, we're seeing less side effects with these newer agents. This is the head-to-head -head comparison of a calibrutinib with a brutinib in the relapse refractory setting of, uh, for our CLL patients, and here the primary endpoint of PFS of non-inferiority was met. Uh, with a calibrutinib was non-inferior to abrutinib, as you can see here. But what was noted was there was a lower incidence of atrial fibrillation and hypertension with a calibrutinib versus abrutinib. Just to delve a little bit deeper into the details of, of with regarding to the atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, uh, you could see here that the incidence was 10% of any grade versus 16% with abrutinib. Um, the, none led to treatment discontinuation with a calibrutinib versus uh, about 17% that led to treatment discontinuation with a brutinib. And the atrial fibrillation flutter incidence among patients who have never had a prior history of atrial fibrillation or flutter was 6% versus 15% with a brutinib. What about the incidence of hypertension and bleeding with a calibrutinib versus a brutinib? Again, there was decreased hypertension uh, about 10% versus... 23% uh, with uh, abrutinib, and the bleeding events, uh, there was 38% versus 51%. So again, some of these signals of a lower incidence of some of the, the class effect of these drugs, less with the calibrutinib. With regards to diarrhea and arthralgia, similarly, similarly you see a lower cumulative incidence of several uh, of, of diarrhea versus arthralgia. Um, and uh, just an updated poster on Sunday at 6 p.m. looking at the adverse event burden score, um, uh, updated data, lower with a calibrutinib than a brutinib with the exception of the diarrhea and headaches. Please uh, go to that poster. Now let's fast forward, um, and I'm going to obviously uh, let Dr. Brown do most of this. So this is going to be the late-breaking abstract on Tuesday morning. This is the data of uh, xanabrutinib versus abrutinib in the relapse refractory CLL patient population. Um, as many of you are already aware, because this did get presented initially last year, where now we have longer median follow-up at 29.6 months, and there was improved continuation, improved PFS with xanabrutinib versus abrutinib. The safety analysis, uh, it, similar to the other study that I showed you with a calibrutinib, there were lower rates of atrial fibrillation and, and, and flutter with xanabrutinib uh, that you can see here. 
And just to delve a little bit deeper into that, uh, AFib and A-flutter of any grade was only 2.5% versus 10% with xanabrutinib versus abrutinib. Interesting, and again, Dr. Brown will present more of this on Monday, uh, Tuesday, Tuesday. Uh, there was, uh, uh, you could see that the rates of hypertension are actually uh, still similar between xanabrutinib and abrutinib. Uh, with regards to starting a patient on a BTK inhibitor, I think what's important to note is there are some things that should be taken into consideration when you're thinking about initiating a BTK inhibitor on your patients. You, obviously, important to take a comprehensive history, uh, blood pressure me measurement, and EKG, and uh, obviously go through their concomitant medications that they're taking, and to assess, you know, their cardiovascular risk factors. You know, do they have diabetes, obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia? Do they have chronic renal insufficiency? They have a history of valvular heart disease or arrhythmias, heart failure, or uh, left ventricular dysfunction or reduced EF? Um, and do they have a history of ischemic heart disease? For patients with high risk, uh, a baseline echocardiogram is recommended. Um, you can consider baseline cardiac biomarkers and using a cardiovascular score for stratification. I think when you're thinking about which BTK inhibitor to use in this scenario, if they have no cardiovascular risk factors, probably any approved BTK inhibitor is fine. If there are other safety concerns, you know, many of us favor a, a, one of the newer uh, second generation BTK inhibitors such as calibrutinib or xanabrutinib. Obviously, if somebody is very high risk, uh, for certainly, we would consider a second-generation BTK inhibitor, and certainly if you think that they're too high risk for any BTK inhibitor, then of course you also have venetoclax. So those are things I think when you're risk stratifying your patients, you're going to try to get an assessment of their cardiovascular risk stratification uh, and then choose accordingly. Obviously, since many of us have, um, uh, because of the data that has been presented with the head-to-head -head data, with reduced incidence of other uh, potential complications of the class as a whole, uh, many of us have chosen to move on and give the newer generation BTK inhibitors due to the potential of reduced frequency of some of the other adverse events as well. I think another important consideration that many of us overlook, uh, hopefully not, uh, is uh, you have to consider the drug-drug interactions with your patients. Um, d aside from all the uh, adverse events that we just went through, and so it's always good to get a, a, a thorough uh, discussion about their medications, whether prescription or over-the-counter medications, because there are going to be drug-drug interactions with some of the supplements that patients try to take as well. Um, and so that's important to get a full list of their medications. Uh, clearly, drugs that have strong CYP3A4 inhibitors um, are important to note because you might need dose reduction uh, of or, or alternative choices for them, depending upon what other agents they may be on with regards to the BTK inhibitors. Um, and, uh, and of course, you also have to look for uh, moderate or strong um, CYP3A4 inducers as well, again, might needing to either to avoid or choose other agents or to dose reduce accordingly. Now, the gastric acid reducing agents have always been a discussion as well um, because many of our patients are on agents uh, for their reflux. Um, particularly, this used to be problematic with a calibrutinib. There's now a new formulation of a calibrutinib, so this now it should be a non issue going forward and that no dose adjustments or need to be recommended for any of the uh, covalent BTK inhibitors going forward. So just to switch gears a little bit and talk briefly about venetoclax, as I said, it's a little bit problematic with the initial ramp up, depending upon if your patients are, uh, if they have high risk disease, meaning an elevated white blood cell count or very bulky disease, they're at more risk for tumor lysis. Um, in the pivotal initial trials of venetoclax, patients with moderate renal impairment were excluded. It doesn't mean that you cannot give uh, uh, venetoclax to a patient with renal insufficiency, but obviously you need to, uh, the consideration for inpatient hospitalization, if they, again, if they have high-risk disease and following the prescribing information um, as it is allotted uh, it may be necessary due to their bulky or high-risk disease. So patients with reduced re renal function, of course, have, need to have more intensive TLS prophylaxis and monitoring, um, and that's very, very important. Once you get b that beyond that uh, and they're, they're debulked, obviously it's a lot easier. But there's no doubt that that needs to be paid attention to quite closely. And sometimes we realize that that may be an impairment to initiate this type of therapy, um, given the fact that, that patients need a lot more frequent blood monitoring and, and so on and so forth. I think that'll be easier in the generation of combining with the BTK inhibitors and venetoclax because you can debulk that way with a BTK inhibitor. 
um, and uh, you know, after several months on a BTK inhibitor, that becomes a lot easier then to do the venetoclax ramp up and usually as an outpatient. But uh, even with the obinutuzumab, there's no doubt that there's tumor lysis with that. So if you front load with obinutuzumab, again, those individuals might need uh, inpatient hospitalization uh, if they have really high risk disease and you're very concerned about tumor lysis if they already have some renal insufficiency. So let's go back to our patient, William. Uh, older gentleman with symptomatic CLL and splenomegaly. He has no deletion 17P. He has an unmutated IgHV. So continuous BTK inhibitor-based therapy. If so, which one? Fixed duration venetoclaxobinutuzumab or chemoimmunotherapy? Uh, obviously, I think most of us have moved away from chemoimmunotherapy, and in this older gentleman who's 76 and he has an unmutated IgHV, we would not recommend chemoimmunotherapy. I think fixed duration VENG is a potential, um, but again, you would have to be, given his renal insufficiency, be cautious about how you go about doing this, um, depending upon what his renal insufficiency is. Uh, continuous BTK inhibitor-based therapy, of course, is okay. He does have history of hypertension, so you would want to make sure that he's well-controlled, of course, uh, but you can then choose a more selective BTK inhibitor, a calibrutinib, although, as I said, Z the xanabrutinib data looks like the hypertensive incidence is pretty similar to a brutinib. Uh, so, you know, I guess it depends on which selective BTK inhibitor you're choosing, uh, but I think those are all potential options. Before you sit down, the, um, you, have a question, you have two questions that you know, sort of tie in, um, at, say, we have short follow-up, relatively shorter follow-up with the second generation BTK inhibitors and the first generation BTK inhibitors. And so um, and the cynic might say, well, if you follow people long enough, all these things, you know, the, the newer drugs are going to catch up and say, how, when you're counseling patients, how do you approach that? presenting that to them and making that decision? No, I think that's a fair question, although I do, I think I would argue that we have much more mature data now with the calibrutinib, um, you know, much longer follow-up with the calibrutinib. Certainly, xanabrutinib, the data is much more immature, for sure, um, but, you know, I think that we have enough data to say that a lot of the, particularly with the cala, that there's definitely a decreased incidence of adverse events. Um, you know, there, I think it's one of those options that when we talk about, um, uh, you know, whether or not to initiate one drug over another. I do tell my patients there are, th there are multiple options for their BTK inhibitors and go through that d data, although, you know, again, you can realize how lengthy these conversations become uh, during your clinic. Typically, if I am, if somebody is at, has a high cardiovascular risk that I'm concerned about, I will absolutely move to a second generation BTK inhibitor. I do think uh, the, that abrutinib is still a good drug, mm -hmm. um, d despite uh, the, the data that I just presented, but given the head-to-head uh, -head data that continues to mature, um, I don't see why there's not a reason to move to a second generation. Great, thanks. All right, so I, I will um, move on and talk about, you know, say, Different times, the title of my talk is different times, different ways for safe and effective sequential treatment. And, um, you know, say, but I'll, I'll uh, you know, before I, before I start, I'll say, um, Nicole and Jackie and, and John, would, would, do we think, and do we, would, would any of us think when, when the, we were three or four years into the Abrutinib story that we would say we had a better drug than Abrutinib? <laughs> So it's, we're, we're, we're really blessed to have three uh, very effective drugs in the, same, in the same class and sort of starting to feel like, like the CML doctor. Not yeah. quite yet. We don't have, I don't know, is, are they up to 10 or 12? No. So, so we, we'll start with a clinical case. And the name, you know, the name is not, the name is uh, disguised to protect the innocent, um, say, but the, uh, you know the case is uh, you know the case is a true one. So, um, say the, the in, and we're going to go through uh, a, a fairly common a, a fairly common um, say presentation that we see in our clinic, and we'll talk about why. So Max is a 70 year old patient with symptomatic p53 mutated by both deletion and uh, mutation, who's, who's healthy, uh, otherwise with a good performance status, and. He was started on, uh, you know, you know Ibrutinib, say, in 2000, uh, you know, say, in 2014, and did well. But then, as, uh, say, as Dr. Lamana said, developed excruciating myalgias and arthralgias 
uh, several years into therapy, and it just, we, we, we did steroids, intermittent steroids, you know, nothing, it, it would work for a little bit, and then his, he just became progressively worse and worse. And so, uh, it, acalabrutinib, it came, uh, you know, came along, and um, we, you know, say we, you know, we started that, and his, his symptoms went away. He was doing fine, and then three and a half years later, we see a slowly rising lymphocyte count, and you know, say, it, you know, the, and the patient, the patient can pinpoint that because he was starting to notice how he felt before he had CLL. Remember, the patient always knows before. Um, often, and then on, on ne next generation sequencing, we found a, B a BTK cis41s mutation. So in each of these scenarios, the intolerance and the um, you know the resistant. What are the next steps? So and I think this sort of brings us to the point about uh, you know, say our uh, you, know, you know our sequencing. You know we have patients you know that are going to have toxicity. And we've heard 40 percent, and it may be even higher than that. Discontinue, mono, discontinue uh, therapy because of into intolerance, and people who are intolerant often stop and start their drug, which is potentially a way for resistance, as developing resistance. Um, yep, it's doing it to me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, talk quicker for each slide. The is say, but patients who develop pro progression have a distinct type of progression, and I think we're, as we get more experience with this, we're just starting to learn. And somebody, I'll just not, not address the question, somebody asked, well, what's the pattern of resistance with doublet therapy? And we have no idea. Probably totally different than what I'm gonna talk about today, which is another reason not to sort of jump on that bandwagon if you don't have to. So, and then finally, this double refractory group, which I'll talk about a tiny bit, but it, it, the, the message would be, if you have a patient that's double refractory, send them to a specialist because it's very difficult to manage. And you know, say clinical trials are probably the best path for these patients, uh, and you know, in transplant or CAR T cells. So, let's talk about BTK resistance. And you know, this as I was going to so I was going to uh, pick another study, but the study that Dr. One of my uh, peers, Dr. Woyak. Published with with the initial ibrutinib experience from you know, OSU has held up you know has held up over time that we sort of have three types of progression you know say progression to, to Richter's which almost always occurs in the first two years unless it's Hodgkin's disease progression you know you know progression um, with CLL that occurs with the cis41s mutation and probably continues over time and then other events. And those other events generally are people who are intolerant, uh, say, and uh, say those uh, you know those tend to occur during the first couple years, but can occur later. So when we think about patients who have resistant CLL, they're probably they're they're really I, I like to think about this in two, you know, in two different ways. Um, so, I, I mean, so I like to think about it biologically. So if they have a BTK mutant you know, mutation, that's telling us that the CLSL is still dependent upon that pathway. And so it's BTK dependent, and probably 65% of patients have, you know, have BTK dependent relapse with a BTK mutation. If they have a PLC gamma 2 mutation with or without a BTK mutation, they're still dependent upon BC, you know, BCR signaling, but they're not dependent upon BTK because PLC gamma 2 mutations bypass that the PLC gamma 2 sits below, and those patients won't respond to a BTK inhibitor. And then lastly, we have this BTK and PLC gamma 2 group, and it's about 20, 30 percent. And these are BCR, I would say BCR less dependent. Uh, and you know, there's, there's a biology here that's just be beginning to be eluded. And, and, th and this, so for the one group, I almost always will give a BCL2 inhibitor. For the other group, an alternative BTK inhibitor. And so this is really where mutational testing can be helpful in practice. So let's let's talk uh, let's talk about this group. Uh, you know, this group that's non-BCR dependent, that's B either BCR dependent, as say, but not likely to respond to a BTK inhibitor or those that we don't know, and 
And say, you know, so we have two groups, you know, the group that, where we see a mutation in BTK, and almost all, almost all of these with xanabrutinib, or xanabrutinib, ibrutinib, or acalabrutinib, this is gonna occur where the drug binds in the CIS-41S site. It can occur in other places, but generally it's, you know, generally it's here. An important point is, if you have mutation in one of these sites, say none of these drugs are gonna work very well. Ibrutinib has a little bit of non-covalent activity, and so it does work for a little bit, but likely switching to a covalent, you know, to a covalent um, drug is gonna be important, and that, that mode of resistance. But then, say, and I'm sorry, a slide got out of line here, so I'm gonna go back. So say we're switching around. So say the, you know, the for the group that are non-BTK dependent, the, the Murano study showed venetoclax was effective, and and you know a study done by Jeff Jones in this in this group of you know of uh, of BTK resistance patients showed again venetoclax not as good as in the upfront study, but in in the um, say in or the Murano study or the Murano study. But still, this produces remissions for um, to, you know, you know, a median of two, year, two years, and, and the patients that have more than a two-year remission do quite well. So, and again, I apologize, a, a, a slide got out of balance, so now we're going to jump back to the non-covalent BTK inhibitors. And remember I said resistance, occur, resistance occurs predominantly in the 41S, uh, where, where um, a cysteine changes to a serine, so the drug can't bind. And you know, we have several small molecules. Pertabrutinib is the furthest along. That really is not dependent upon this 41S site. Um, it's, say it, it binds whether or not it's there. And, it's, it's, uh, and as a consequence of this, and this will be up, this will be up, updated, say on Monday in say in an oral session. This drug, you know, this drug with extended follow-up in, in a lot of patients, 276, 276 patients, um, and you know, the majority of these uh, were, were heavily, heavily pretreated with, you know, with approximately, you know, with approximately, say, uh, almost 100 having mutation in the, in the CIS-41S site. And you know, what you see is no matter what risk factor, you, you know, what risk factor you have, the response, uh, you know, the response rate is 70, you know, plus percent and higher, and and you know whether say, and when we look at the uh, you know the progression-free survival, we're you know, we're seeing in this whole group of patients uh, who have, who uh, are either intolerant or refractory to BT to BTK inhibitors, the progression-free survival is an average of 19.4 months, um, and so this is quite respective and. And the safety of this, the safety of this is quite, you know, is quite good as well. The, the, the safety data will be updated, but there's no big surprises coming forth from that. With Nam, with Namdebrutinib or a, ARQ5, the former ARQ531, there's less data. There's less data on this because it it took um, Merck a little bit of time to confirm, uh, you know, the initial phase dose, phase two dose from Arcule. Of 65 milligrams was correct, so there's so this is this this one is behind. This is a, this is a broader in, a, you know a broader inhibitor than uh, you know, but also is is a non-covalent. And what you see is the response the, you know the response rate in CLL it, it, you know is about 53 is about 53 uh, percent. And cord a cord A you know say cord A. Represents uh, patients, you know, say patients with the cis41s mutation. And again, when we look at when we look at say, when we look at the progression, the progression-free, you know, the progression-free survival, you know, small numbers, but it looks fairly, you know, fairly similar. So we have two drugs, at, you know, say one pertabrutinib that's further along, and uh, you know, say nenadabrutinib. And that's a tongue twister, um, is, which is uh, far, is coming up behind it. That you know, you know, that are effective in this area. I think it's no surprise. You know, cancer is smart. CLL, you know, CLL B cells are the masters of mutating. 
and you know, the, a really, really, uh, you know, a really, really nice paper from Dr. Wang that was published earlier this year in the New England Journal of Medicine shows that unlike with the with the with the covalent BTK inhibitors, with you know, so, you know, with the non-covalent inhibitors, you see BTK mutations all over the gene. You see them in you, you see them say. Yeah, all throughout the the, the catalytic kinase domain, um, it's, and you know some of these some of these have a very strong phenotype and mediate resistance to the uh, you know to the uh, covalent inhibitors. Others uh, you, know, you know others don't, um, and and so it opens a whole other avenue. And a few of these a few of these were seen rarely in ibrutinib patients, like the gatekeeper, the T seven four four seven four I. But this is just sort of generated a whole other area of, you know, say, you know, we would consider pertubertinib and ARQ531, third generation BTK inhibitors, their fourth and fifth generation BTK inhibitors that are being developed based upon this. So again, the CLL field is following the CML field. Um, well, uh, sort of new on the block are the BTK degraders because, uh, you know, say, one, one way to assure you don't outsmart, uh, you, know, you know, that you don't develop a mutation is to just get rid of the get rid of the protein, and Nurx is the is the first company to develop a BTD, BTK degrader, and you know and the, the principle of this you know you know Ben Eber's group showed the principle of this is what we do what we do with uh, lenalidomide is essentially to degrade icarose and ilose, but it, say we use a ubiquitin ligase. And, and this is something that binds to cerebron, which is a, 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 a and this generally is a, is a lenalidomide, uh, an amid-like molecule, like lenalidomide or thalidomide or pomalidomide. And then you have a, you have a linker, so you have linker, and then you have a hook, which is often a, a BTK binding drug. And say so when that and when that happens, BTK gets you know, you know BTK gets degraded. And the the neuros, the, you know, the neuros molecule also have this, this same complex, is, say, you know, this, you know, this cerebron recruiting complex, um, say, also recruits Icarus and Ilos, like, when, like when a lenalidomide does. And so potentially you have an immune modulatory drug together with a BTK degrading drug. And there, there'll be data presented uh, at, at, in the oral session on Monday uh, evening uh, with this, you know, with this drug clearly has some activity in really, really refractory, uh, you know, patients, including, you know, including patients that are double refractory, and that's where the study is focusing. You know, say there are some some unique toxicities potentially with this uh, agent, combining it, combining um, which which were seen when you combine BTK inhibitors with, um, you know, with the amids in earlier studies as well. So. A big question is, what do you do with the CAR T? What do you do with the patients that become refractory to BTK inhibitors? Become refractory to first gener or the first or second generation molecules become refractory to the no to the non-covalent inhibitors. And then you go to venetoclax, and then they become double refractory, and but that that's a tough group. And uh, you know, say, doc, uh, say, you know, the the transcend CLL04 study showed that. In this group of in, in this group of patients, there is a salvage. I don't know that it's curable. It's going to cure the disease. Matter of fact, I don't believe it's going to cure the disease. But it gives the patients a, a, a chance to get out of this, you know, median of five months of of, of survival and no long-term survival in our experience outside of you know some aggressive therapy for this group. So, what about intolerance? That's that's the other big issue, and you know there's more and more data on this, and and you know we know that a good number of patients who get these drugs initially, particularly ibrutinib, but also acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib, a certain percentage will go off because of intolerance, and the you know, you know the good news you know the good news is uh, say patients you know patients who become you know, you know who become Intolerant to ibrutinib, whether it's early or late, you can put them on a second-generation molecule. And this study that Dr. Rogers led showed that, you know, showed that the progression-free survival with acalabrutinib after ibrutinib was, you know, say, was very, very respective. 
the only issue, you know, the only issue um, that comes up is these, you know, say, is because these patients have often had start and stop and often have been on two BTK inhibitors, there might be more emergence of the Cis41S mutation in this group. Um, here, you know, here in this, again, prospective study, they showed most of the patients who developed one of these toxicities didn't have a, rec didn't have a recurrence. And particularly, the, 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 I truly believe, and I think there's animal data to support, you know, that SARC is, is, SARC is clearly hit by ibrutinib. It's not touched with acalabrutinib. And so there probably is an early AFib that's associated with ibrutinib that doesn't occur with xanabrutinib or acalabrutinib. You know, say, and, it's, it's, and, and, you know, the fact that you can rechallenge patients with, uh, with a second generation molecule, whether it's acalabrutinib or ibrutinib, sorry, acalabrutinib or xanabrutinib, and not C AFib, you know, really supports this. Similar data with xanabrutinib really, you know, essentially showing you can give xanabrutinib, say, in both, uh, in both ibrutinib intolerant, but also acalabrutinib, acalabrutinib intolerant and not see the same side effect occur. And, you know, say, I, when we had two, I didn't think we would need a third, but I'm probably, probably both of you as well have seen this where patients don't tolerate ibrutinib, they don't tolerate acalabrutinib, and they go to xanabrutinib and do fine. Um, it, it'll, there'll be an abstract uh, presented here, say, you know, discussing, uh, discussing pertabrutinib being effective in this same group and not seeing a recurrence of you know, AFib and other, other things. So we come back, you know, we come back to our patient initially with intolerance on ibrutinib, what do you do? And then who develops a Cis41S mutation by itself uh, with progression on a calibrutinib. In each of these scenarios, what are the next steps? You know, I would say for the, you know, for the, the you know, the patient developing intolerance, Either a calibrutinib or xanabrutinib is an effective choice. I tend to use a, you know, a calibrutinib just because there's longer there's longer follow up, uh, and xanabrutinib is not yet approved, so it's off label right now for you know for CLL. It's in the NCC and guidelines. Venetoclax certainly is acceptable, but I I I, I never change class of drugs and say when a class of drugs is working because because I think say venetoclax has much less follow up than the BTK inhibitors. Um, we have to keep in mind that when we intolerant patients, you're going to see resistance more often. And then for the patient at, at, who develops progression um, on a, a BTK inhibitor with a Cis41S mutation, I apologize that my presentation got a little bit mixed up. But Cis41S mutation, I stick with a I stick with a BTK I stick with a BTK inhibitor, although venetoclax is an option. And you know, again, the summary of thoughts and big points. You know, BTK intolerance does not exclude this class of drugs. We have two other, say, covalent BTK inhibitors. Hopefully, soon we'll have a non-covalent inhibitor approved. BTK inhibitor re resistance requires a change either to a different type of, of BTK inhibitor or venetoclax. And you know, using your, muta your mutational data can really help in that setting. And then finally. Patients, uh, you know, patients with BTK inhibitor resistance, you, you know, say you, one can switch or, and double re, double refractor disease have uh, you know have limited options right now, and we really need to be thinking about um, alternative therapies such as cell therapy. So I'll end there, and we can take some of the questions from the audience. So we've got a bunch of them. So. Let's um, let's let's start. Let's say let's start. Nicole, um, it, there was a question about the durability of MRD in the in the BTK, uh, you know, the BTK venetoclax combination, the BTK inhibitor venetoclax combinations. Do you want to say something about that? Sure. I mean, obviously, we know that the patients on the study so far with the BTK ven combinations, the responses are really robust. And the MRD data, as Dr. Barriento showed us, was very good. Obviously, we're going to need longer follow-up to see how that MRD data goes, given that we have, I guess, from the updated data from studies like Captivate, about two years or so, about two years mm -hmm. that they've been monitored off of their initial therapy. Uh, and so I think, stay tuned, obviously, we're going to be following uh, to see how that MRD data goes accordingly, because as we pointed out, 
this might be a, a very good potential option for even our high-risk patients with 17P or P53, given what we saw with the VENG data uh, and the concern that the progression-free survival for those individuals um, is obviously shorter than chronic continuous therapy with a BTK inhibitor. So I think the MRD data will be very telling and also help us maybe select who might be better, you know, uh, for those kind of combination options uh, for oral, oral combination or even triplet combination. So the MRD data is good, but uh, still immature. Great. Jackie, um, it, it, you gave a, an exceptional presentation on, on high-risk disease, which is really the group of patients that develop resistance. And I think there's a very good question that was asked. Do we, is there a strategy that you know of to prevent patients with 17P and P53 developing resistance, and if there's not one, say, <laughs> what, what strategy would you, what's, if you had a, a 40 year, if you had a 40 year old with that, what strategy would you take, you know, to try to prevent that from happening? So as of right now, the best data that I have seen are for young patients, if they have 17P lesion, P53 mutation, it's continuous daily dosing with a BTK inhibitor, and if they're having issues with tolerability, um, I switch them over um, to a second generation BTK inhibitor, or if, or initially I just start them with a second generation BTK inhibitor because compliance and keeping them in remission is my utmost important uh, goal. Now, there are very, very promising data where the combination of venetoclax with ibrutinib in patients with 17P lesion. It's looking like they can achieve the same amount of complete remission rates and undetectable MRD. And in the few patients that have relapsed so far, there's uh, evidence that these patients are still responding to ibrutinib when they get rechallenged. So I think things might be changing, but we're not there yet. So as of right now, my um, go-to drug is a BTK inhibitor for frontline continuous daily dosing. Here's a, as I say, Nicole, um, it, we have acalabrutinib, xanabrutinib is coming soon. What is the place of ibrutinib? <laughs> diminishing. Um, <laughs> I think that's fair to say, diminishing. You know, I, I think there's no doubt that there are, you, you know, all of us have been part of all, all of these studies uh, with the BTK inhibitors. And uh, they're, they're, my patients who have been on a BTK inhibitor with ibrutinib and doing well and fine, I, I leave them. I mean, again, this goes back mm -hmm. to the CML story. Yeah. You know, I leave them on ibrutinib. They're doing great, and, and there's no toxicity. They get beyond a certain point, and they're doing fine. That's, that's what I do. But for the newer patients, there's no doubt I'm, I'm typically starting a second-generation BTK inhibitor. Um, but I think what John, what Dr. Bird pointed out was very true. I think what we try to do is really maximize the class, knowing that many patients will wind up getting more than one of these classes during the course of their journey. They'll go from a BTK to VEN or VEN-BTK. And so they're going to be utilizing more than one agent. But if they have an intolerance or an issue, again, since we're thinking strategy long term, mm -hmm. we're going to try to utilize another BTK inhibitor if possible. So I do think it's diminishing, but... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call you by doctor if you don't call me by my first name. <laughs> so, so, this is a common gender thing that happens. Yes. And, and the only reason I'm calling is, um, is, you know, Nicole and Jackie by their first name is that they're calling me by my first name. And, <laughs> and, and so, but this, you know, to say, a, a point out moment. Um, so, so, so um, I, I would comment, I, you, know, you know, I would add to that, that I remember when we were developing, and, and Bob Dugan, has, who was the CEO of, Phar of Pharmacyclics when this was coming along, he said, John, I can't wait when, you know, we have to make our money back on ibrutinib, but at some point, ibrutinib is gonna cost five cents. I don't think that'll ever happen. <laughs> say, you know, say, you know, per pill. And you know this will be available, and so I think the patent life of ibrutinib is moving away. And and really, I think as you look at the cost right now, the cost of the medicines are the same. But you know when when ibrutinib goes generic, this is going to be an issue. And I I agree with you completely. I don't stop ibrutinib in anybody that's been you know that's been on it because it's it is it's, say if it's working. You know the old military adage: if it's if it's not broken, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, so say, but it's, say the cost of these drugs as they go generic, it's going to become it's going to become an issue. I suspect just like it has, just like it, it is with CML. Try to give a, a second or third generation CML drug without 
I'm at, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to do. And that would change things, wouldn't it? Yeah. Because <laughs> as we said, when we, when we uh, you know, when a Bruton was the only game in town, well, we dealt with it, we, we, right? We, we, yeah. Of course, it's a great mm -hmm. drug, and we deal with the side effects for our patients. If it was five cents and it was availability to everybody, um, then the second generations might be considered differently. So, um, Jackie, here's, a, here's a, a, a question, and I think people are asking. So, so you know, patient, a, you, know, a, you, you say you're practicing, in, you're practicing in Idaho, and they say you have a double refractory patient. How do you manage them outside of a clinical trial? So, um, we still have the PI3K inhibitors. I don't use them the way that they have been prescribed. Uh, I maybe just use the PI3K inhibitor for like two months, and then if they achieve some sort of response, I lower the dose, and then I give them treatment breaks to minimize the risk for colitis or pneumonitis. Um, that's one option. The other option is I add on other mm -hmm. agents, like if they felt ibrutinib by itself, um, I might add on uh, obinutuzumab in that case, just to get some extra, you know, uh, bang for your buck before I switch them over to another drug. So, that's Nicole, what's what the, I do. Yeah, you? absolutely. So if if they're not eligible for a trial uh, and or refuse or have limited availability to therapies like CAR T cell, depending upon where they are, then absolutely. Then I think depending upon the agent, you can add on either double oral or antibody, um, and sometimes you can sequence that way and buy some time um, uh, for sure. And, and, and there's finally, I think I think the Ohio State group published a, a paper showing it just came out in blood advances showing the a doublet, uh, you know, so, you know, so even and I, I've been amazed so even with Richter's transformation. Sometimes you can have somebody that progresses with Richter's on venetoclax was refractory to ibrutinib or acalabrutinib before, and you get both, and you know the patient goes has a has a, a very very good response or complete remission. Thing to, thing to remember, though, with that, and I didn't put that in my slides, mm -hmm. is it doesn't last long. Right. So, so, and and so, you know, if you, once 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 people come out of that, you're you're managing you're managing a disease that morphologically looks like CLL, but is acting like Burkitt's yeah. in mm -hmm. terms of how aggressive it is. Um, so so. Um, we might do some all these bad goodies like uh, rituxan high dose methylphenicillin, like back in the day. Have you done that? I have, yeah. yeah, not not good outcome. Yeah. yeah, there's just there's little there's very little data on that group other than that they do very you know they do very very uh, poorly. Um, a question. So so we do IGBH mutation at, at diagnosis often. I mean, do either of you when you're ta do you consider that a, a high risk abnormality anymore when when you're talking to patients about treatment? Well, I guess not anymore because the, the targeted agents make it an even playing field, so either a BTK or a VEN are acceptable. I mean, obviously, we still test for it, and it's important um, to have that as a baseline because it tells us a little bit maybe about the biology of their disease, but obviously, the, these, uh, the, the agents that we have make these folks do so much better now that, it, yes, it's less of an issue, but... Yeah, I still mention the data for yep. long-term CLL14 where um, we see that the median PFS is about 60 months. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a good fixation treatment strategy. Yeah, yeah I, I think the new, the new drugs we have, have been, are just really a game changer mm -hmm. for almost every patient except for somebody that has a P53 mutation or a 17P yeah. marker. Yeah. And, that, that, you know, that really most patients, most pa and, and I sort of even, we're talking about patients at the time of therapy, but even when I'm seeing people when they're newly diagnosed, I will, you know, you know I really try to give the pep talk that really be, for, for the IGBH unmutated patients before we had the B BTK inhibitors, you know, if it's a young patient, you know, their life was going to be shortened probably, you know, and, and now that's not the case. Um, say, Jackie, does a, a a yeah, really good question. Do you think if we use more selective BTK inhibitors in combination with venetoclax, we might mitigate some of the toxicities seen in the GLOW study? So I, I honestly think that the GLOW study toxicities were because of the age of the participants. Um, because we didn't see that dramatic number of grade three or higher events in the captivate study. 
Um, and I've spoken also with Nitin Jain, who did the uh, ibrutinib with the netoclax, and in his experience, he also had a lot of uh, potential toxicity. So in theory, yes, I believe that um, doing a second generation BTK inhibitor will most likely decrease the potential toxicities um, with, uh, in combination with the netoclax, but by itself, in a young, healthy patient, I wouldn't hesitate to use ibrutinib with the netoclax. But, but there's no doubt there's increased toxicity with the combination, oh, yeah, albeit, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's for a much shorter time because the patients are gonna come off therapy, but mm -hmm. definitely something to pay attention to. Yeah, that's the reason why I try to do as much as possible, especially in elderly, a monotherapy if possible. Even if we get approval for both combination, very unlikely that I'm going to give uh, the combination for an older patient. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think there'll be, you know, so there'll, be, there'll be more and more data, there'll be more and more data mm -hmm. coming out about that. Um, so, uh, it, it, here's a, uh, is there any subclonal mutation at treatment initiation that helps you predict um, uh, appearance of a BCR signaling independent clone at progression? No. I, I mean, obviously we're always concerned about the mm -hmm. SF3B1, you know, as a potential, but I, I'm not sure that it changes what we're doing currently. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, I would agree that problem, I do next generation sequencing in uh, people before I start and with a, a fairly broad panel. And there, there are small overlap muta you know, mutations. So generally, generally when you look, we, and here I think we'll learn from right. the AML literature here that for most kinase inhibitor drugs, mutations that activate NF-kappa-B or activate the, the MAP, RAS, MAP kinase pathway mediate resistance, but those data are just starting right. to mm -hmm. emerge, and sort of the classic SF3B1, notch, sure. you know, notch mutation, we say really it's, uncl it's unclear that those are going to be pr predictive of secondary you know, resistance. Um, and I think hopefully as we move towards a fixed duration treatment strategy, we can minimize the emergence of these resistant mm -hmm. clones. So, um, what, so, you know, for, for patients that have gone on fixed duration therapy with venetoclax, with venetoclax and, and, a, and a benetuzumab, how, you know, how do each of you approach uh, treating, you know, treating them when their disease comes back? Uh, you know, obviously, you know, thankfully the experience on CLL14 has been really uh, very good with many patients having a, a robust response duration and, and not requiring therapy for many years. Uh, but of course, you know, we expect that at some point the majority of those patients will relapse. And I, I think that there's no doubt there's, uh, and there are studies that are going on, uh, the Revenge and other studies that are going to be looking about retreatment in the frontline setting. Uh, with venetoclax. Uh, you know, there's always a concern, although limited data, most of this data comes from the Murano study in the relapse setting, uh, where you can rechallenge with venetoclax. Of course, if somebody is uh, relapsing within a very short time period after their time limited therapy, we're always concerned about whether we should rechallenge with venetoclax if they're relapsing within a year. Again, there is a study that will be addressing this, so I think that'll be important to see. Uh, if they have a longer period of time, uh, before needing retreatment. I think retreating with venetoclax is certainly an option. Uh, and I guess the question I have to, to my panel is, do you do BCL2 resistant mutation testing prior to doing so? Jackie? Or not, does it matter? I haven't done it, no. I haven't had that many patients. Hey, well, that, <laughs> that's a good problem. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, so we do, we do it, and you know what's interesting with the mutations in BCL2, you see them, but they're you know unlike with BT, the BTKs are often appear to be subclonal. These are very 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 subclonal, um, and and so we we do them and and sort of, More of an I wouldn't I wouldn't use I, I would it's, but it's an academic question as you said, and there aren't very many mm -hmm. thus far. Um, we say I think. I think there were, say, I, I know there were a couple of questions that came in relative to, uh, you know, the endpoints in studies, in particular, in particular, the, um, the you know, say, is overall response a relative, uh, you know, a rel you know, a relevant primary endpoint? That's a good point. Um, and you know, for for the for trials, what do you think? 
I mean, obviously when we're talking about, um, you know, the BTK inhibitors as chronic continuous therapy, uh, you know, we have this debate all the time is if patients are otherwise doing well and they're not getting a complete response, uh, but, uh, you know, their cytopenias have resolved, their lymphadenopathy and organomegaly have resolved, but they still have, you know, a little bit of uh, CLL in their bone marrow, but otherwise doing well, is that relevant for an older patient? And I would argue probably not. They're doing fine. Um, so I think it's important that depending upon uh, what the goals of therapy are with your patient, uh, you know, that, that needs to be discussed. And this is why the success has been of the chronic continuous BTK inhibitor-based therapy, because patients have done so well for so long, yet the majority of them still have some residual disease in their bone marrow. So I think it really depends on uh, what you're uh, trying to achieve. Obviously, with the combinations, I think that's different in achieving MRD hopefully will translate into something differently about the time off of therapy and, and PFS and time to next treatment, uh, which might be relevant. So for me, the most important things is the overall survival and how the patients feel. Because overall response rate, we had amazing overall response rate in frontline 17P when patients were treated with either Alicep when Susan O'Brien presented that, but patients were sick yeah. and that, that all the studies were stopped. So it, I would prefer um, some form of primary endpoint as progression-free survival as a surrogate for overall survival, and in patients treated with a drug that can achieve undetectable MRD, maybe that as a surrogate for overall survival. At the end of the day, it's overall survival and how the patients feel. Yeah, I, I, I think I think so. so surrogates, surrogate endpoints are just that they're you know they're to real endpoints that patients care care about, mm -hmm. and you know I think one of the things that we're going to discover. That you know, even, even, and this is coming out with the venetoclax with the venetoclax combinations. That even if patients go into MRD with p53 mutations, they come out of MRD quicker because the clone, the clone, you know. So that that versus the progression-free survival. Mm -hmm. And you know, I love your what you said. How the patient feels, mm -hmm. say you know, is important. We, I think, I think this is this is a non-BTK related question, but I think it's important that everybody is wonder, everybody is asking now, and say, are you still advising you know, CLL patients to get every shell? Um, say, um, and I'd be curious what your what each of your institution what you're doing right now with every shell with Omicron. My institution pulled it. Um, so you're talking about every shell. Every yes, shell, yeah. Uh, you know, so obviously the, with the, the ongoing changing of the variants, uh, clearly the, um, the monoclonal antibody treatments are obviously not catching up as quickly. Uh, and so actually at our institution, we're no longer giving it. What are, Jackie, what are, you doing at your, what are you doing at your institution? Stopped it. Yeah, I think so. But I wasn't sure if it was because the FDA also said that they it no longer it. works. Oh, so. well, I'm sure. That yeah. and financial. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, the, so so I think I think the, the data that exists right now with every shell, I mean, it's om, Omicron is Omicron unless you're giving it for say is not effective in vitro, and and that's for sure in some places 50 percent or more penetrant. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I, I think we're we're giving it with counts at our place with counseling. But expecting that it's going to likely go away, and I think the the take-home message with COVID for CLO, and I, I, I would say at our institution, say with this last six months, we we've, we've had 50, 50, probably over 50 people with with CLO that had COVID, and just getting in front of it with Paxlovid, mm -hmm. and early intervention makes a big difference, and you know, and I think there's going to be an abstract at this meeting that, no matter what therapies patients have gotten. Is if COVID COVID is not as bad as it was for CLL patients if you get in front of it with therapy? Has that been your experience? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, I think one of the things that we're also seeing uh, over the course of the past couple of months is we're seeing something that we saw also akin pre-COVID with other viruses like influenza and RSV is that they get through the COVID part because it's not as severe. Yeah. But they get the post-viral complications of bacterial infections, and so yeah. it's you you know weak three to six, yeah. you know, that period where I'm nervous about how patients are recovering because we, we've had several admitted due to bacterial and super infections you give, after COVID, and that's that's a concern. Do either of you give, a, if, if patients are hypogammaglobulinemic and they get COVID or influenza, yeah. do you, it, our practice is we will, if their IgG is, you know, low, that we will at least give them one dose of immunoglobulin. I, I do. 
you do that? Yeah, you know, the the question is, is it help in the time period of, uh, but yeah, do I, I mean, I use lots of IVIG, so. All right, well, say so we wanna thank all, we wanna thank all of you. This activity is certified by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peer Review Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.